Hey, how's it going, guys? Welcome back to another PS4 and PS5 jailbreak news update. So first of all, a couple of things that have been happening. We did get a new Hacker One bug bounty report showing up on PlayStation's bug bounty program from The Flow, and The Flow received a $5,000 bounty. Now, normally for a kernel exploit, it would be $10,000 or more. That's typically the going rate for something as severe as a kernel exploit. So probably something less significant here but it's still in the high severity category. So you can see high severity reports are $1,000 to $10,000. You'll get a bounty for if you submit a valid report there. And the flow has got $5,000 for that particular report. So this does coincide quite nicely with the release of 12.52, which wasn't that long ago, where we got a message saying that PlayStation have made some security fixes to the system software in 12.52. So it's likely whatever the flow reported here is likely to be what was patched in 12.52, just based on the timing. Typically what happens is PlayStation will release the new patch that patches whatever vulnerability was reported in Hacker 1, and then about a week later or so it will get resolved in Hacker 1 and then will appear here that everybody can see once that has been confirmed that the latest update that they released has in fact fully patched the vulnerability that was reported so that it can then be resolved here in Hacker 1. And that's typically what you see, and the timing definitely lines up very well for that. Now, we do have some further information that was brought to us by Zeko, so Zeko XEO on Twitter. He also posted a YouTube video basically comparing the Java security file in the BDJ stack, which has been changed as of 12.52 compared to 12.50. So you can actually find this file yourself. You can just head into FTP on your own console and go to the system underscore EX directory and then go into the app folder and then MPXS20113, which is the Blu-ray player, and then the BDJ stack folder, the lib folder, security, and then java.security, that is the file that was changed. If we take a look at the file itself, on line 189 and line 206, those are the two lines that were changed in 12.52. So this version is from my 12.02 console right now, so this is what it looks like on 12.02, most likely pretty much the same on 12.50, I believe. So you can see we've got package.access equals sun.com.com.sun.proxy.com. Now, apparently what was changed here is that this was basically added to it. And apparently this was also added to this line here as well. So it would appear they've essentially expanded the number of packages that are now protected. So some of those packages that weren't protected in previous firmware versions could have perhaps been used to escalate privileges in some way, maybe for a user land exploit, but we'll have to wait and see on that. So I guess we could say that there is a chance, at least a good chance anyway, that there might be some kind of vulnerability that can be exploited again with the Blu-ray player, with BDJ. And the best case scenario, I guess, with that would be the ability to actually use that to then trigger the lapse kernel exploit up to 12.02 so that you'd be able to load the jailbreak with the Blu-ray disc instead of requiring those expensive and hard to find Japanese titles. Of course, we won't know until either the Flow's report gets made public once it's disclosed, which could be several months down the line, of course. So we'll have to wait and see if that happens, but obviously there might be a chance that other, you know, exploit developers might be able to figure it out also and release it earlier so that we might have access to whatever this turns out to be sooner than having to wait for the Flow's report to get disclosed. So anyway, I thought that was definitely, you know, worth a mention here. Obviously, we don't know entirely if this is going to end up being some kind of Blu-ray exploit. I just want to be clear, this is mainly speculation at the moment based on what has been revealed. So, you know, obviously take everything with a grain of salt until we know for sure. Okay, so moving on to some more things for the PlayStation 4. We did, in fact, get a fix for the black screen and save data corruption issues on 9.xx firmwares when loading the LAPS exploit, the new jailbreak using the web browser with PS3. So using the older WebKit exploits to load the newer jailbreak, which allows us, of course, to jailbreak entirely from the web browser on firmwares like 9.00, uh, 9.03, up to 9.60, which previously had to use older exploits like the PPPone exploit or the USB exploits, which require additional devices to jailbreak the console. But you can do it entirely from the web browser. Of course, the general consensus was not to use that exploit, because of the black screen and save data corruption issues that you would get when launching some of your games. 
Now, there is a workaround for this. I made a video kind of showcasing it in a tutorial. But the idea is that there is a old Gold Hen plugin, which is the AIO Fix plugin for Gold Hen. You can just install that plugin if you're on, you know, any of those 9.xx firmwares loading the lapse jailbreak from the web browser. And if you enable that plugin, it should resolve those issues. And I did do a test of this using one of the GTA Definitive Editions and it was getting a black screen. But as soon as I enabled the plugin, it would eventually load the game and the save files worked fine. I didn't get any save data corruption. I was able to create a save file on the game and then, you know, exit the game, relaunch it again and continue that save file without any problems. So if you are wanting to use that exploit, if you really just cannot stand using the USB drive on 9.00 or using the PPPwn exploit up to 9.60, then you can use the lapse exploit now if you enable that plugin to fix those problems. Now, again, there may still be other issues with the lapse exploit on the web browser. So obviously proceed at your own risk. But if those are the main issues that were stopping you from using it, you can use that plugin to resolve those problems. So moving on to some PS5 news, we're also seeing some progress getting K-Stuff ported to higher firmwares above 7.61 to get your homebrew applications running. And of course, your PS5 game backups and fake packages for PS4 games on those higher firmwares. So at the moment, 7.61 is the highest firmware, but there was a video that originally comes from Echo Stretch here showing the PS5 remote Lua loader on 8.00 being used to load K-Stuff on that firmware. So it looks like Echo Stretch has managed to successfully get K-Stuff loaded at least on 8.00 and potentially higher. So there is definitely some progress being made in that area for everybody who is waiting. You can clearly see Echo Stretch is working on it and is making some progress there. We do have a new build of PS5 Debug released by CTN. So this one now adds 7.xx support. So all 7.xx firmwares on the PS5 should be able to use PS5 Debug, which can be used, of course, for remote debugging of the console. So connecting uh, debugging tools, mod tools, trainers, and various other things that you can do with PS5 Debug, including, of course, the Save Mounter, which has also been updated. So we have a new version of the PS5 save mounter. Now this only works right now for PS4 saves on the PS5, not PS5 saves themselves. But you can essentially mount your encrypted save files and extract the decrypted save data from it and replace the decrypted save data of your saves. So this particular version of the save mounter from Nullpointer has had a bunch of support for different firmwares added. So the original version only supported a very small number of firmwares particularly older ones like 4.03 but this particular version here supports 7.40, 8.20, 10.01 .10 and then we got support for 4.03 and 6.02, 9.60 was added, 5.02 and 9.40 and then of course we also have 5.50 and 7.20. So to load the save mounter we need to load PS5 debug which you can do on 7.xx firmwares now with the new version using the Blu-ray exploit or the Lua exploit. With the Lua exploits, you can use its PLK's latest autoloader, which loads the Lua menu with different payloads that you can select. You can go to the Manage Payloads option in the top left-hand corner, and it will give you the IP address and port number 8084 that you can enter in your web browser on another device like your computer that's connected to the same network. And then from there, you can use the Upload option to upload another payload to the console, and you can select the PS5 debug payload, and then go back onto the console and refresh the page, and that payload should then show up that you can load. So that's how you get it running using the Lua exploit. And then for the save mounter, you also need to load FTP afterwards as well. And then also, of course, with the Blu-ray exploit, you can just put the payload on the root of a USB drive, plug it into the console, load Victorious X's ISO, and then head over to the disk menu and select option one for UMTX1. Once that loads, you can select option two for the ELF loader. Once that loads, you then want to select option three for the jailbreak which allows you to load payloads from the USB. And once that one's loaded, you'll then be able to go over to the USB menu and the payload should show up and you can load the PS5 debug payload. And then of course, load the FTP payload afterwards as well, if you're wanting to use the save mounter. Now, one of the new features in the save mounter is that this version does not require you to run the game, which is important because some games actually mount the save file when the game is first loaded. And if the game has already mounted a save, the save mounter will not allow you to mount another save file. And that was causing a problem, especially for installing these saves for the Lua exploit. So just to show that that can now be done with this version, you can see that I have one of the Japanese games that can be used to load the jailbreak. Currently, it's just running a normal save file. And then if I go over to the save mounter, enter the IP address of the PS5 and connect, then use the patch option to apply the patches. 
And then we can grab the account name of the account we're signed into and then the game, get the titles and select the title ID of the game that we're trying to replace the save for. We can then grab the save files and select one of the save files that shows up. So we can see we have save data here and then I can select the option to mount that save. So now the decrypted save data is mounted in the MNT PFS directory. We can just go to that directory in FTP, MNT, PFS, and then the save data folder, which now contains our decrypted save files for that save. And I can just swap those out with another save file, another decrypted save. In this case, I will use the its PLK autoloader save file to get the Lua exploit on there. And when it asks me to overwrite the save files, I'll just confirm it and that will get all of those save files copied over. And once that's done, we can then unmount the save inside the save mounter. So now when I go to load the save file, it runs the auto loader, the Lua exploit instead of the original save file. And we've easily swapped that save file out. So that's just a quick example of how you can use the save mounter, especially now on games that previously were awkward to try and replace the save files for because they perhaps loaded the save file as soon as the game was loaded, preventing the save mounter from then being able to mount a save. That's not really an issue with this version because you can mount save files when you're not running the game now. So that is definitely a welcome change. Now, if you want a more detailed guide on how to use the save mounter, I have made a video before on the older version, which I will leave linked down in the video description, which goes into more detail. And finally, we also got a write-up from OSM, old school mods, about PS4 retail kits, basically debugging investigation in PS4 retails, uncovering a bunch of dormant debugging features from development and test kit consoles that still basically exist in the retail units and that can potentially be brought back to life to be able to access a lot of these debugging features on retail consoles. So he has done a pretty in-depth write-up on this. This is the first part of the write-up that has been released. So if you're interested in looking into that, you can see here the conclusion. The findings confirm that Sony's retail kernel retains nearly the full debug backend with mDebug, basic, fuse, and associated syscalls, all still present and functional, just hidden behind environment checks. By mimicking the correct environment and patching a few guardrails, we can unlock a surprising amount of dev kit-like functionality on retail hardware. In part three, we'll take this a step further by exploring the DCI daemon and what it would take to bring Sony's official debugger back to life. So trying to get Sony's original debugger actually working at least partially on retail units, which would be pretty interesting. So I'll go ahead and leave this down in the video description also if you want to read more into it. But anyway, that's going to do it for this one. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video or found the information useful. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. And once again, I'll hopefully see you guys in the next one.